Hi class, welcome to the next section of chapter 5, chapter 5.2. Today we're going to go over Newton's method. So this is um, a numerical method. Just like when we were looking for limits, we plugged in a bunch of numbers and saw what happened as we got closer and closer and closer to our limit value. Um, it's not the same thing, but it's somewhat similar in that we're looking at values um, and looking at their decimal approximations and trying to maintain a certain level of accuracy, right? So <clears throat> we're going to go ahead and go over this method. So this method is very powerful. It's used, it's pretty much what's used by all your, your calculators, um, Desmos, things like that, when they're trying to figure out a value that you're looking at. Um, they're generally using Noon's method in order to calculate those values, okay? So Noon's method is a numerical method for finding zeros, or you can also use it for solving equations, which is what we'll do today, um, right? So we're finding solutions of a function. So <clears throat> it's referred to as a root finding method. So there's many, many root finding methods, and most of them are some sort of variation of Noon's method. Um, we have what are called like corrective measures. We have, uh, there's all kinds of things. We're not going to get into it because that's uh, really a much, 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 much higher level course than the one that we're taking right now. But if you get really good at these type of methods for root finding, you can find your job, uh, yourself a pretty nice job in optimization, which pays uh, pretty nice. So most calculators and numerical solvers are going to use this method. As I said before, your calculator, Desmos, um, those kinds of things or some variation of this method. Okay, so let's go ahead and talk about the method in which we use this method, right? So what we do is we pick a point, um, we evaluate that point on our function, and then we find the tangent line um, at that point. We then find the zero of that tangent line, okay? And then we use that zero to start the process all over again. So it's an iterative method. You do the same process over and over and over again. So if we want to find the zeros of, it has to be a continuous function, um, or the solution to an equality of functions, which we would then set equal to zero, right? So either f of x equals g of x, which we would then um, set equal to zero. <clears throat> and then we can use this method, because again, this is a root finding method. So we have to be able to solve for zero for these. So no matter, so that's always the first step is you can use this method for a lot of different things. And uh, sometimes the trick is forming the question into an equation where it has to equal zero. Okay. Uh, so we choose a starting point, which is x naught. We plug that into our function. So we have a starting point. We find the tangent line at that point. And then we find the zero of the tangent line. So it's pretty straightforward, okay? And then we do this all over again. So the zero of the tangent line, we then plug into our function and find a new tangent line at that point, and then find the zero of that tangent line. Then the zero of that tangent line, we plug into our function, find the tangent line, and find the zero of that tangent line, and so forth and so forth and so forth, okay? So we start off with x naught. Plug it into our function, get the tangent line. The zero of that tangent line is our new approximation for the zero. So we call that x1, the next point. We plug that point into our function, find the tangent line, find the zero of the tangent line. The zero of the tangent line at x1 is the new uh, approximation for zero for our function. So then we call that x2, okay, and so forth. All right, so we use this to find our next function value. As long as this is not zero, then we find the tangent line at x1, and the zero of this tangent line is going to be my x2, right? So we're really just doing the same process over and over and over again. And what should happen is that our approximations, x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, they should get closer and closer and closer and closer to zero, okay? So we, pre we repeat this process. Most of the time, you'll never actually get to zero. So the goal is to get as close to zero as possible so that the difference between your value and zero is almost nothing okay and so the value that we're using is not zero itself but the output when we plug it in should be getting closer and closer to zero right so when we plug in this value to f it should be close to zero so again 
<clears throat> as I'm plugging each of these larger and larger points into my function, it should be getting closer to zero. Uh, if that's not the case, if it's maybe bouncing back and forth, back and forth, um, and not getting closer to zero as it's bouncing uh, back and forth, or perhaps um, as I'm plugging in each successive value, I am getting even farther away from zero, right? Either more negative or more positive. Then basically what happened is I, I chose a bad starting point and I'd have to start a new value, a new x zero and start over. So really my choice of x zero is really what makes or breaks this process, okay? So choosing a value that doesn't work well typically happens when you choose a value that's close to a local maximum or minimum. Somewhere where the derivative is very close to being zero for your uh, initial point that you choose. Okay, so consider this function. Uh, if you see here, this is my zero. This is the top of a, a hill. This is a local maximum. If I choose a value around this, it's very possible that I'll never find a value because my first tangent line will be very, very straight and it'll come way out here. And so then when I evaluate this at my, my function up here, I'll get a value that's very, very straight and I'll come way out here and I'll never really get closer and closer to the zero. So I really want to pick somewhere that's not, that has a derivative value that is not very, very small, basically. Okay. So let's say I choose this as my first value. So this is the output value here, f of x zero. And if you notice the tangent line here has a very large value, its value, its slope is not close to zero at all. It's a large value. So it was a good choice to for me to start. So I look at this tangent line and I find where the tangent line intersects the x-axis. That's my new approximation. So I'm going to plug this into my function and see what I get out. Well, my output is not quite zero, okay? But it is a lot smaller than what I had before. So at least I'm I know I'm moving in the right direction. I find the tangent line there, okay? And the zero of this tangent line is my new approximation, x2. So I look at the output of x2, and I notice I'm smaller again, right? So I'm smaller than I started, I'm smaller than the previous value. So my outputs are getting smaller in value. So I find the tangent line, I find its uh, intersection with the x-axis, the zero of the tangent line, call that x3 and now look it's a very very small value out when I plug it into my function which is good because that's what I want I want the outputs to get smaller and smaller and smaller or at least closer to zero it could be possible that they're negative depending on the function and so the tangent line here I look at the zero for the next tangent line and that's very close it's very close to the zero it's not exactly the zero but I'm getting closer and closer and closer. So uh, my graph won't let me actually draw anything closer than this because because um, I can't zoom in, right? So if I went to Desmos and continue this process, we could look a little bit better, but it would be very hard for me to do this on Desmos. So we're gonna just have our drawing here. So again, let's look at this process. I choose a point, find its output, find its tangent line, find the zero of the tangent line. Plug that value into my function find that output, find the derivative at that point, find the zero of that tangent line, right? Plug that into my function, see what its output is, find the tangent line, look at the zero of that tangent line, repeat the process, okay? Plug that into my function, see how close I am to zero, and then I keep going and keep going until I either get zero or I'm so close to zero that it doesn't matter that I'm far away, right? It, it, I'm so close, it doesn't matter that I'm not actually at zero. For any calculations I would need to use, I'm close enough for it to work. So that's what your calculator does, right? It doesn't get exactly at zero, unless it's a nice function. If it's using Noon's method, then if it gets within five decimal places of zero, you don't even know that it's not at zero. So um, a lot of times you're not using the exact value of zero, but you're very, very close. So obviously we have to use the equation of the tangent line over and over again. So from the last section, we have a generalized formula for that. So whenever I'm looking at the point x equals a, I know my tangent line or my linearization of my function 
is f of that value plus the derivative at that value times x minus that value, right? So that's my linearization, that's my linear approximation, my tangent line. So if we start at x naught, then our tangent line looks like this, right, as a generalized formula. So I'm looking for when this tangent line is equal to zero, okay? And so we're gonna call that x1, right? So my point is zero x1 for the line, it's equal to zero. I'm gonna call the point where that happens at x1, so x1 is zero, satisfies the equation of the line. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna solve for x1, right? Because I would like to know what x1 looks like. So if I solve for x1, I'm going to get my function evaluated at my previous x value divided by the derivative evaluated at that x value plus my previous x value. Okay, So my new point now is going to be x1 and f of x1. So I'm going to take this and I need this uh, to satisfy the tangent line as well. Okay, So the tangent line here would be at x1. f of x1 plus f prime of x1 x minus x1, right? Just like before using this generalized formula with this new point. So now that I have this new point, same thing as before, I know that when this equals zero, I'll have my new point x2, okay? So the interception is x2, so I'll say zero and x2, and then same thing, I'll solve for x2, right? So I'll subtract f of x1, I'll divide by f prime x1, and then I will add this x1 to it, to isolate my x2 value. <clears throat> so if you notice, it's very similar in the form. Um, the only difference is, is that instead of x not everywhere, it's x1, right? So I'm using my new x value and my new f of x value and my derivative. So I'm just plugging in my new x value into my function and the derivative in order to find my new one. I can do this over and over and it'll always look the same, right? So sooner or later, I'm gonna get to a point where I'm close enough or I'm as close as I need to be or Maybe I have a certain tolerance level. I have to be within uh, a millionth of a value in order for it to work for what I need it to do, right? So you can think of, um, let's say that you work for Pepsi and you work in the bottling factory and you're, you design the bottles. Your caps have to screw on just right so that in transportation, your bottles don't pop open, right? So you need to have a good enough seal. Now, obviously, they're not actually fused together. Otherwise, the distance between the cap and the bottle would be zero, right? But I need it to be within a certain tolerance so that no liquid can escape. So maybe that value is like one one thousandth of an inch or like one hundred thousandth of an inch. So if I was doing this using an equation, my tolerance level would be, you know, one one hundred thousandth of a value, right? So I'd be very, very, very close to zero, but not actually zero. So then maybe that's my tolerance level. Okay, so that's how tolerance levels are set. So that's how we know how many zeros we're gonna need, right? That's just an example, right? So my generalized formula for is gonna be uh, my next approximated value is always my current approximated value minus my uh, current function value divided by by my current uh, derivative value, okay, the slope of the tangent line. So again, if we want our answer to be accurate to, let's say, k decimal places, so for my verbal example, um, right, I need it to be a hundred thousandth of an inch, so I need it accurate to six decimal places, right? So let's say I needed five zeros before I see any numbers, okay? Then we continue our algorithm until I have stability in that decimal position, right? So I would do it until my x values start to stabilize at the fifth or sixth decimal place in order to make it sure that I'm accurate to one one hundred thousandth of a um, inch, I guess, right? So again, <clears throat> this means that we need to use as many decimal places as possible as we do our calculations. Okay, so if you want to keep your your level of accuracy, you do not round you use all the decimal values that you can as you go through this process, okay? So it has to be more than k. So if I need to be accurate to seven decimal places, I can't be rounding at five and then 
think that I'm going to be okay, right? If I need seven decimal places of accuracy, I'm going to need more than eight, okay? If I'm only rounding to the eighth decimal place, I'm still going to have error that's accumulating. I really want to have like 10 or 11. I want to be like an extra four or five decimal places out if I want to be accurate to the eighth decimal place, okay? Really, you want to be, you want to keep all the values you can, right? Or use your exact values um, if possible, right? I, a lot of times you're not going to be able to use uh, exact values, <clears throat> so you're going to have to use, you know, some rounding at some point. But you want to watch out for round off error and, and things like that, okay? So again, if you're using your calculator, uh, your calculator will give you your values when you press enter. Um, but I wouldn't plug those in from scratch each time. Most calculators, like the TI-89s and 86s and things like that, you can just go up to your last output value and press enter, and it'll plug in that entire answer. More values than you can actually see yourself. So if it's only giving you six, six decimal places, if you go up to that answer and your cursor is where you need to plug that value and you press enter, it'll put in all the decimal places that it has in its memory for that value okay so then that way you can avoid runoff error so don't just use the values that you write down on your paper or whatever try to use whatever previous output you had from your calculator actually go up to it highlight it and press enter as you're plugging it into your to your um to your values okay so let's go ahead and do an example okay so let's go ahead and find the solution of e to the 2x equals negative 2x plus 5 accurate to 7 decimal places so if you've ever had one of these problems before you know that you cannot solve one of these problems algebraically there's no way for us to figure out uh, when these two functions are equal even if we zero it out and do all kinds of manipulations to it it's not going to happen um, if you use your calculator by graphing this and then seeing the points of intersection you're basically just doing um, Noon's method, but you're letting the calculator do it for you. Okay, so this is very useful for people who are programmers or who wish to be programmers. You generally would use one of these types of functions to um, program a solver or something like that, right? So <clears throat> again, we can solve this. We cannot solve this using regular algebraic means. Just to verify, let's say I took the natural log of this so that I can get rid of the e and turn this into 2x. Now I have 2x equals a natural log, which I still can't solve, right? Rules of natural logs, I cannot break this apart in any way that does not distribute to each term. It's a common mistake that people use for natural logs. I can't do anything here. This is it. Um, I can't isolate x on one side of the equation, okay? There's no way to isolate my variable. So uh, what we do is we take it and we move it over to one side and we turn it into one single function it doesn't matter which side i went if i moved the right side to the left or the left to the right it doesn't really matter either way i need those either of those functions to be equal to zero okay and i want it to be accurate to seven decimal places or whatever value i find when i plug this into here to make it equal to zero right so we need to choose a starting point. Again, I would prefer to use one where the derivative is not close to zero in form. Um, we can use x equals zero because that's a nice number. Um, when I plug in zero, this turns into one. This goes to zero. This is negative five. That gives me a negative four. That's not close to zero at all. So it's a nice place to start. So we'll just arbitrarily choose x equals zero as a starting point for us. So I have f prime of x is 2x, sorry, 2e to the 2x plus 2 for the derivative, which is nice because as I go through this process, remember I'm going to need my derivative function. I'm going to be plugging stuff into it and into my original function, finding the ratio of the two and then subtracting that from my current approximation. So for right now, x equals 0 is the value that I'm using. Okay, I have my derivative. When I plug in uh, 0 into my function, you already saw that we get negative 4 out, okay? I'm also going to plug in 0 to my derivative function, which will give me out uh, 2 plus 2, so 4. And I'm going to subtract that from my current x value, which is 0, right? So to find x1, I use my x0, and I plug x0 into my function, and I divide that by 
x of 0 into my uh, derivative function, right? So I'm plugging in 0 everywhere, right? So e to the 2x plus 2x minus 5, plug in 0. My derivative in the denominator, plug in 0. 0 is my current value, right? So again, to find the next value, so here I'm at n is 0, right? And then the next value is 0 plus 1 or x1. So I'm following this formula. So I get 4 and 4. Okay. So e to the 0 is 1 times 2 plus 2 is the 4. This is 1 minus 5 is negative 4. And then I'm changing the sign because it's 0 minus that amount. So I got a positive 4 over 4, which is just 1. Okay. So my uh, next x value that I'm going to check would be 1. Right. So from 0, I'm moving forward to 1. To find what's going on here, I'm going to plug this in. Okay, so I'm going to have 1 minus me plugging 1 into my function divided by 1 into the derivative, right? So f of x over f prime of x for x of 1, my current value. That's how I find my next value. So when I simplify this, I'm going to have 2 minus 5, so that's going to be minus 3. This is going to be e squared. This is going to be 2 e squared plus 2 plug that into my calculator and subtract it from 1 and I have 0 0.738405054044423 so I'm using lots of decimal places here right I'm using everything I can as I go through this process now I can plug this into my function and see how close I am to 0 right that's one way to, to see if I'm accurate to 7 decimal places to be 7 decimal places would mean that when I plug this in I should have lots of decimal places of zeros. Um, but the way that we really do this is that we look for stability as I continue to move forward in my x value. So remember what's happening here. Uh, if we come here, look how far from my first x approximation, I was very far away. My next one, right, was a decent size, almost one unit for this example that I did here even though you don't know what this function is. Okay. Oops. My next was a lot less, right? Here was almost a whole unit. This is almost like half of a unit away. Okay. My next approximation was even closer. Okay. And then x4 was very, very close. So what's going to happen is my x values are going to start to normalize, right? They're going to start to agree with each other. And so if I want uh, k decimal places of stability, right, of accuracy, it needs to stabilize. My x values are going to stabilize in the k decimal place, meaning that I want to keep going until I have stability in the seventh decimal place, right? So my first approximation was zero. My next approximation is one. There's no, nothing is agreeing here. It's two completely different numbers, okay? My next approximation for x2 is 0 0.7384 that has nothing in common with the value above it right so each time so far the the x value i have is completely different than the previous approximation i don't have any stability yet nothing is the same from one approximation value to the next so far okay i'm going to plug in this x uh two value to get my x3 approximation so i'm going to start with my value i'm going to subtract to that me plugging in the whole thing as much as I can into my function and dividing by me plugging that whole thing into my derivative function. Okay, I'm not going to show you the math like I did here because here I'm just showing you what's happening, right? I had a nice number for the first one and then after that I'm starting to get decimal approximations. So I'm trying to keep as much information as I can, right? Obviously, I have way more than seven decimal places that I'm using as I go through this process. So I'm going to continue to use the same number of decimal places. So when I plug this into my calculator, this is the value that I have. So for x3, I'm stabilizing now for my ones place, but my tenths place is still different. I got a six and a seven, right? But I'm no longer a whole number. Um, and I have these other values, right? So nothing is the same. So I'm looking from the beginning towards the end, what is the same? So far, nothing is the same. So I, haven't, I don't have any stability yet 
So I got to keep going, right? Um, I do not have any decimal places of accuracy yet. So I'm going to do this again. I'm going to take this value and I'm going to subtract from it me plugging this value into the function and the derivative. So on the next line, x3 is going to tell me that x4, okay, is the current value minus me plugging in the current value into my function divided by my current value plugged into my derivative. Evaluate this and I get this evaluate this uh, approximation for x4. So real quick, I just want you to, to notice that my x4, I take my x3 and I do these things, right? So right now my x4 is here and this right above it is my x3, right? You can see here that I have x3 twice, okay? 0, 6, 5, 8, 8. I have it twice. This is my x4 and now I can start to look. The 6s are the same, the 5s are the same, and everything else is different, okay? So I have two decimal places of stability right now. I have two, two places have stabilized. So I have accuracy in two decimal places. And that's what I'm going to look for. As I go through this process, I want everything to start to be the same as I find my next approximation. So I'm going to use this X4 now to find my X5. So my X5 is my current X4 minus X4 inside of my function divided by x4 in the derivative. When I evaluate this, I'll get my approximation for x5, keeping it right under the current x4 so I can see how much is in common. So now I got one, two, three decimal places of accuracy, right? Six, five, and three, and then everything is different. So now I have three decimal places of accuracy. I'm going to do the same thing. Take my x5, right? This approximation I have, and I'm going to plug it in um, to find my x6. So I'm taking my current x5 value, subtracting from it all my function and derivative stuff, evaluate it, and I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 numbers that are now the same. Okay, So I went from having none to 2 to 3 to now 9 places of accuracy. Right, So I am accurate to at least 9 decimals. And it's only nine because I'm comparing it to what I have for the previous values. So it could be that when I plug this in, I have even more than nine places of accuracy. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I have stability um, up to nine decimal places. All right, I have nine decimal places in common with the previous approximation. So I'm accurate to at least nine. So nine or more places. If I plug this into my actual function, this is how many zeros I have, right? So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. I have 12 zeros. So I'm accurate to 12 decimal places of accuracy, actually, because everything is zero until I get to the 13th decimal place. So I'm very, very, very close to zero, right? For anything that I would need to use this for calculation-wise, this is good enough. So for those of you guys who are going on to uh, computer science, engineering, or physics, um, this is basically what you do most of the time is you run algorithms like this um, and you try to get as accurate as possible up to, again, a certain tolerance. Okay, that's pretty much the majority of the work for for um, computer science and for engineering. Physics, uh, physics, you do this quite a bit also. Once you get into the higher levels so this is called a numerical method in um, a class generally that you would take as a, a stem a student would be called numerical okay so let's go ahead and put all of this information in a table so it's easy to read because at the moment um, it's not right I know it's it's kind of hard to see here but again I try to line things up so you can see the current value um, versus the new value so you can start to see uh, your numbers start to stabilize so using a, a table, this is what it looks like. So this is our value of n, okay? So this is my value for xn. So this is, right, x1, x2, x3, x4, x4 uh, x0, x1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, etc. These were the values for x0, x1, x2, x3, x4, etc. And then these were the function output. So I never actually showed you the outputs that we had. Um, Right, so the values that would be here in the numerator. So I compiled them in a table for us so that we have, when I plug in one, this is what I would get out from my function. 
If I plugged in two, this is what I get out. So as you can see, I'm getting smaller in value, right? I went from negative four and I jumped to something larger than four. So I kind of jumped around from the, the initial point to the next point because I actually moved further away from having an output of zero than I was before. But then from there, I got really close to being zero. Here I have one decimal of accuracy for being zero. Here I'm three decimals of accuracy. Here is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So here I probably would have taken this as an okay answer because you have quite a bit um, of zeros, right? More than seven. So you are accurate to what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. You're accurate to eight decimal places. So this um, previous answer would have been fine, but we didn't know that until we checked the next value and we saw how many places of stability we had and so we had more than seven decimal places of stability we knew we had more than several decimal places of accuracy in fact we had 12 decimal places of accuracy so here we're accurate to um, eight places because we had eight zeros right because my goal again is trying to get as close to zero as possible so um, that's the way that this works analysis which is what you would take after you're done with all of your calculus stuff